Hey, welcome to Non-Standard Models, where we venture into the world of theoretical physics. Today, I'm here with Christophe Crochon. Hello. And Lina Laspar. Hi. Christophe is a research group leader at Humboldt University in Berlin and in Daisy Homburg in particle physics. And Lina is a PhD student working in Christophe's group. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Together, they study the properties of a very special particle called the Higgs. And today they're here to tell us about a particular aspect of it, namely whether this particle is made of elementary constituents or not. For a long time, theory struggled to find a way to explain the masses of the particle in the Sander model, which is the theory that nowadays best describes the microscopic universe. In the 60s, they finally found the solution. They conjectured a new type of mechanism involving a new particle, precisely the Higgs. Only recently this particle was finally observed. Right, Christoph? Right. The Higgs is turning 10. It was in 2012 that the Higgs particle was finally produced and observed at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN near Geneva. It was a great success for particle physics and its early prediction is one of the biggest achievements in theoretical particle physics. Nevertheless, there are still many mysteries surrounding this particle. Indeed. We are not even sure if this particle is elementary or not. You see, elementary particles are the fundamental constituents of nature that cannot be made of something else, like the electrons. On the contrary, protons are composite particles which are made of quarks, and these quarks are assumed to be elementary so far. In the standard model, the Higgs is assumed to be an elementary particle. However, this causes problems, which can be addressed if you would assume the Higgs as composite. Okay, so what are the problems that arise when we consider the Higgs as a fundamental particle? Could the Higgs ultimately be composite? Let's find out. Before talking about a composite Higgs model, let's take a step back. We mentioned before that there was a huge breakthrough when theorists discovered this mechanism called symmetry breaking. Lina, can you tell us more about what symmetry breaking is and how it is related to the mass? Sure, but let's start with an example. Imagine a ball sitting on top of a hill and this hill is shaped like a bell. Now, at the beginning, the system is symmetrical such that you won't be able to tell in which direction the ball will fall if pushed. However, it's also unstable. Even the slightest breeze will push the ball to fall to the valley. Now, when it, when it eventually falls down, it breaks the symmetry because it falls into a certain direction, but it will be stable. Now, this is pretty much what symmetry breaking is. You, you start with a symmetrical but unstable situation and then with a slight perturbation the, the system falls into a non-symmetrical but stable state. Now, the Higgs has the same features. The Higgs has an energy and this energy we call the Higgs potential. It has the same configuration as the bell-shaped um, hill. However, it's just energy. Now, in the early universe, it was pretty much hot and the, the Higgs was sitting on top of this hill. And the slight perturbation was when the universe cooled down, the Higgs just fell into a stable but non-symmetrical configuration. Now, while the Higgs is sitting in the, in the valley, you try to push it, you'll, see, you'll feel some resistance. This is what could be attributed as the Higgs mass. Okay, so it's like the resistance to gravity is the mass of everyday objects. Yes, precisely. Okay, okay, so this is how the Higgs acquire its mass, but the interaction with the Higgs transforms the other particles too, isn't it, Christoph? Exactly, that's the way the Higgs give mass to the particle of the standard model. I mean, the quark, the charged lepton, namely the electron, the muon and the tau, and finally, the W and Z boson themselves. What is important to note is that all these particles are fundamental particles, and the stronger they interact with the Higgs, the heavier they are. For example, take the W and the Z boson, the massive brothers of the photon. 
Before electric symmetry breaking, they are massless objects. But 10 to minus 10 seconds after the Big Bang, they absorb the Higgs particle and become massive objects. While the photon you know, doesn't interact with the Higgs and it remains seen and massless object flying freely in space. The X plays a crucial role because from its interaction with the other particle you can actually predict the masses of these different particles. So studying the interactions between the Higgs and the other particles, we can quantify the mass of these particles. But what about the Higgs mass? How can we compute it? Well, in general, you would assume that to measure a mass of a particle, you would simply put it on a scale like everyday object. However, this is not possible for the microscopic world, the quantum world. In this strange world, the particles split and recombine. And if you were to put some particle on a scale, hypothetically, you would get different values for its mass every time you, would, you do this measurement. So you need to take the average. Unfortunately for the standard model, this is not possible for the Higgs because the standard model has no prediction for the Higgs mass. Rather, you need to supplement it from experimental measurements. Are you saying that there is no way to know the mass of the Higgs? Actually, perspective changes if we acknowledge that the standard model is not a complete description of reality. In fact, indeed, it doesn't include gravity, for instance. We know for a fact that the standard model is valid theory over a very large range of energy, but still a limited range of energy. And if we go at higher energy, at the very least, the Planck scale, you know, the scale at which gravity becomes a key player, we expect new monsters, new beasts, new particles. And the peculiarity of the Higgs boson is that those new particles actually through the quantum process that Lina explained, you know, give a contribution to the mass of the Higgs boson itself. And the trouble is that those contributions are about 20 order of magnitude larger than the experimentally merged mass of the Higgs boson. I must confess that this is very embarrassing for a theoretical physicist, you know, when a theoretically natural value of a quantity differs so much from the experimentally merged one. We talk about a hierarchy problem. You know. Of course, there are ways out, in particular when we fine-tune the various parameters of theory in such a way that the quantum processes that contribute to the mass cancel each other out, leaving us with a boring merger quantity. Mm, but fine-tuning is a bit controversial, isn't it? Because in the end, it may just seem like a lucky accident. Those quantum corrections are huge numbers, some come with a plus sign, some come with a minus sign, and they just happen to cancel each other when we fine-tune the parameters. True, true. Uh, nevertheless, there are ways out, there are solutions to the hierarchy problem that don't involve fine-tuning. Right? But for this to work, you, know, you will need to introduce new particles, new forces, new phenomena. Which is good, because these are plenty of things to discover at colliders. Yes. Here, composite Higgs models kick in. Imagine that the, the Higgs boson is not an elementary particle like the standard model predicts. Rather, it's made of new particles that are not yet discovered, you know, just like the proton. This changes the game, as for composite particles, their mass generation mechanisms are different, albeit more complicated. But hey, at least we don't have any fine tuning. Oh, it's true. It happened before that particles that were believed to be fundamentals were later discovered to be composite, like the proton. Yes, you are right. But in this particular case, we care about another composite particle, the pion. It was discovered in the late 40s, 10 years after its theoretical prediction by Yukawa, and it was found later to be made of two quarks. What's relevant in this particular example is that the theoretical description of its mass is based on another example of symmetry breaking. Let's go back to the example of, of the ball on the hill described by Lina before. In this particular case, after electric symmetry breaking, you are producing not only massive particles, but also massless ones. Remember, you know, the mass can be seen as a resistance of a ball to move out of the valley. Nevertheless, in this particular case, there are another direction that doesn't oppose any resistance. Can you guess which one? Mm, it can still circle around the hill? 
Exactly, and although it's difficult to imagine, this symmetry breaking mechanism actually produced two particles. A massive one stuck in the valley, and another one massless circling around the valley. This massless particle is precisely the pion. However, if the valley is not perfect, the symmetry is not perfect either, nobody is perfect. It's like saying that if the valley is not exactly flat, the pion acquires a small mass. Okay, so it's the fact that the imperfection of the valley is small that guarantees that the theory cannot give rise to very heavy pion, right? Right. So this is what we would say as the symmetry protects the pions from large quantum effects. So the mass of the pions will remain small. Okay, I see. Let me recap a bit. So we have two different symmetry breaking processes. The first one, in which we have the Higgs as a fundamental particle stuck in the valley of its potential, and the second one, the one you just mentioned, in which we have a composite pion that instead moves around the hill. And what you're saying is that a composite Higgs would behave like the pion, and therefore it would have a small mass. That's right. This would be a way to bridge the gap between the experimentally measured Higgs mass and its theoretical prediction. In 1979, Steven Weinberg proposed a framework called Technicola. In this framework, the Higgs is made of new fundamental particles, just like the quarks, we call them techniquarks. Nevertheless, experimentalist has already ruled out this model, but its descendants are still active area of research and there's a lot to be discovered. Technicolor sounds cool, but Lena, I'm curious, how did they rule out the original proposal? Well, we have ways to constrain new physics models. In the 90s, amongst others, Michael Peskin and Tatsu Takeuchi have proposed three quantities that are particularly sensitive to new physics effects. And we have measured them with great precision. Technicolor models predicted deviations from the standard models on these quantities. Sadly, these deviations were greater than what we have already constrained. So Technicolor failed this indirect test. Okay, so this is indirect because this we're not actually looking for these new hypothetical components of the Higgs in colliders, but we're investigating the effects on the physics we know. But I guess that physicists are also working on more direct tests. Yes, it's true. And that's why it's so important to carry on experiment on the Higgs particle. There is still room you know, for direct experimental testing of the composite Higgs model, with the aim of directly producing new particles, the fundamental constituent of the Higgs. Nonetheless, even if our collider were not powerful enough to break the Higgs into pieces, you know, we could still probe its compositeness nature. Think, for instance, of a nut. You, know, you don't need to break it to know that there is something inside. You just need to shake it. So let's do the same with the eggs. Let's shake the eggs. <laughs> this is a really beautiful metaphor. <laughs> Thank you for this nice chat, Christophe and Lina. Thank you. Thank you. And for helping us putting together the pieces of this composite puzzle. And thank you for watching. So let's shake the Higgs. See you next time here on Non-Standard Models. Mm -hmm.